There we go. So now if I go ahead and just, um, when you do a mount, you'll just see it down there at the bottom. It basically uh, notes it as uh, being uh, a mounted uh, directory. If you use that as HFS. And uh, if we CD into work, there's some uh, there's some files that I've got, <laughs> and they it pulls across the ownerships correctly. Uh, it basically does everything. He's got a bit of a cache built in there, so it's fairly efficient, reasonably speedy, even under uh, even under slower uh, connections, um, and it's very very useful. Um, if you're a systems administrator and you need to do a, a quick bit of bodging around and you need to uh, transfer a bunch of stuff over. Or a bunch of stuff over. Sometimes it's it's quite handy to have, and I've I've used it quite extensively. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're also using it in LTSP to uh, to mount the uh, home directories. So um, um, that's one uh, that's one file system. Another one that's come up uh, Google uh, uh, Google Drive. Uh, they've also got a uh, uh, there's a file system uh, fuse file system out there. Uh, Google Docs FS. And that's another fuse file system that you can mount your your Google Drive on your uh, your local machine. Mm -hmm. Just treat it like a uh, treat it like a file system. Um, it's kind of still in beta, a little bit rough around the edges, but it does work, and uh, that's worth looking into. So. Well, the biggest problem that we that we had when we were looking at the, the document management, we were beginning to uh, uh, to work on coming up with uh, what it was that we were going to uh, to implement was we didn't want people, we didn't want the legal staff having to go into a web-based application and pull up their documents and pull check them out, push them back in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second thing that we wanted was we have uh, quite a uh, um, quite a big investment in multifunction machines. Most of the multifunction machines can scan to either a Samba share or they can scan to email. And what they wanted was, as the uh, clerical staff are handling evidence and scanning in documents, statements, etc., want them to be able to basically stand at that multifunction machine and just pound stuff in, right? Not have to switch back and forth between I'm going to scan in a document, then I'm going to stick it somewhere. And then I'm going to scan in a document, then I'm going to stick it somewhere. We had a, a couple of different uh, um, um, people come in, and uh, both of them, their solution was, well, you know, essentially what we want to do is, what you want to do is basically get your either a, a, a scanning workstation, have the scanner attached to the workstation and have the person basically scanning, categorizing documents and getting them in, or alternatively, uh, have two people, literally, hire another person. So you have one person doing the scanning and then have another person, you know, that they're shouting and saying, okay, document this to this. That wasn't what we wanted. Um, the second problem that we had was, of course, for the people who, the, the legal staff that are creating these documents in open office, they just want to save. Right? Um, we went through some development uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and we updated uh, one of our web apps. And I don't know whether any of you have had to deal with this, but we actually had this whole procedure where we were counting the number of clicks that people were having to uh, uh, do their their day-to-day -day functions, right? Because they couldn't have any more clicks. You know, it took me 15 clicks to do this, or 15 keystrokes to do something. And we, we can't, we have to have no more than 15, because if we have 16, oh, we, we, there's just no way we'll be able to do the same amount of work in a day. So one of the big things that senior management that charged me with was, or is, is looking for is something that is not going to significantly change uh, the workflow that uh, that the users are going to have to go through. From my point of view, I want my files to be backed up in a database. Okay? Uh, I deal with uh, currently, right at the moment, uh, gigabytes and gigabytes worth of data. But once we actually start scanning in. Uh, evidence, 
once we start storing things like uh, camera, uh, surveillance camera videos, once we start storing things like pictures or police statements or those sorts of things, we're not going to go, we're not going to be in the gigabyte range anymore, we're going to be in the terabyte range. Right? Now, one of the things that I should note at this point, Legal Aid being a, a, a government organization, and specifically one of the reasons why we went with Linux, I run uh, a, uh, my side of, of IT is three people, myself and two help desk personnel. Uh, our application development side is essentially two people. We have five people. Outside of salaries, I got $100,000 a year to run the entire organization. That's it. That's got to cover all my hardware. That's got to cover all my software. That's got to cover all my internet connectivity. That's got to cover the whole nine yards. Okay. I'm squeaking every penny right, for everything. So I haven't got uh, a, a lot of room. And one of the problems that we're beginning to run into is backing up on a nightly basis is beginning to get to be a bit of a problem. Right? We, we have to, but, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, you're mentioning backups, and it just made me think that you were talking about how you have to get rid of documents, and how how does that happen on all these backups that are stored? Right, right at the moment, and this is uh, we have to handle evidence right at the moment as a completely separate issue, and what we have to do is we're dealing with uh, evidence that's coming in from the crown. Uh, evidence that's coming in from, uh, you know, you have a, a break-in at a uh, McDonald's or something like mm -hmm. that, right? So you're going to have some some stuff that's going to come out of the, the police department, maybe some taped statements. You're also going to have, you know, the the, uh, the video surveillance uh, uh, stuff that's coming in from the McDonald's, and that's in some wacky format that you've you've never heard before. And we have a whole thing around that. Yeah, well, you know, they'll they'll take uh, they'll take a standard you know MPEG and they'll wrap it in some proprietary layer so that you can't just you know use it. So every time we get one of these things, you've got to literally go on to you know Acme surveillance company software site download this onto the laptop for the uh, for the lawyers so that they can view this right now we're handling all of that with uh, out of the scope so we're not saving any of that but the problem is it's becoming a real problem because it's because it's not part of our standard desktop environment if the lawyer has uh, neglected to bring an external hard drive or the DVD drive with them and they happen to go off to court, they're kind of screwed. They don't have this evidence uh, at court. So it puts a huge uh, amount of, uh, of onus on the, on the lawyer to be managing their, their gigabytes. Right? That's not what lawyers want to do. Mm -hmm. That's not what lawyers are good at. Right? Lawyers are good at doing law and really we want our lawyers to be practicing law. They shouldn't have to do that. I and mean, I should be able to provide that in some way, either via a connection back into our system, via VPN. Uh, we're beginning to get some faster pipes now uh, at the courthouse, so when they're at the courthouse, they, they should be able to view a video or pull down a video real time. They're on their Windows laptop. They should be able to mount that video back at head office and just get it, view it, do what they need to do, have it over encryption connected, and then when, they're done, when the uh, case is done, right, that video is just going to go away. That's what we want. We want to provide for the lawyers that kind of thing. Right now, they're managing all that themselves because we literally do not have the ability to delete this stuff in a timely manner. And the problem is, is the penalties for not doing it are high. Right? In, in a regular environment or in an environment, let's say you've got an engineering environment, right? You've got almost exactly the opposite problem. You just never want to delete anything ever, right? Right. Which is fine, right? All you have to do is come up with the way that you're going to lay out your directory structure and the way you're going to archive things and, and, and all of that sort of situation. And you just keep buying hard drive, right? You just keep shoveling hard drive at the problem, shoveling tape drive at the problem, and, and, it's, and it's an issue. For us, forgetting to delete something could result in sanctions against the lawyer by the law society, 
If it's my fault that it didn't get deleted, it could mean me getting hauled up in front of a judge. So why aren't you doing your job? And if I don't have a darn good excuse, right, 30 days in the who's gal for me, that's contempt of court. I'm not managing the court's data. Uh, as as a systems administrator or legal aid in Manitoba, I've actually had to take the oath, right? The oath, the 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 court oath, and I'm I'm you know duty bound to look out for for people's data. Also, morally speaking, I mean these are these are not files that you want hanging around out there. So the cost for not doing stuff is very very high. Potentially, you know, involving fines. Uh, involving you know, court time, involving being disbarred. So we need to come up with something that's, that's, that's going to allow us to say some files are going to hang around forever and some files, when I want them to disappear, I want them to disappear right now and I want them to disappear from everywhere, from the backup, from, from, you know, from the off-sites, etc. Well, about the only way that you can really accomplish that is, is with a database. Right? With a database, you can you can uh, uh, set stuff up. When the document is coming into the system, we can perhaps set a trial date as part of the uh, as part of the thing. We can set appeal dates. Lawyers are very very good at maintaining their trial dates and appeal dates. They need to do that. If part of that is being picked up by the document management system, you can keep track of, and when the when you actually get a disposition date, when the when the jury returns a verdict and the trial is uh, the case is now over, then you can have the the database automatically search through for anything that's reached its its conclusion of the disposition that you're doing. Yeah. So that's the kind of things. The other thing that we need is is uh, searchability. Right? One of the biggest problems that we have and we deal with constantly. What do people do, especially when they're dealing with documents, right? I don't remember what the document is called. I don't remember I don't remember when I created the document. I don't remember, you know, anything like that. But I do remember that MacGuffin was the name of the respondent, right? So what do they proceed to do? They proceed to search the entire file system for the word MacGuffin, mm -hmm. right? And if you've got uh, literally legal aid that does uh, 20, 30,000 cases per year, each case is going to generate anywhere between 20 documents and thousands of documents. And we've, uh, for most of these documents, uh, unfortunately, we've never deleted them. Okay? A lot of the paper, when they get printed out onto paper, that's gone off to the Manitoba Archives. The Manitoba Archive will destroy the piece, uh, the piece of paper in seven years. Right? For us, of course, we keep saying to the people, go and make sure that you're uh, that you're deleting your documents after a while. But I mean, we're still seeing documents from 1998, 1999 hanging around. Why? Because people aren't focused on going and cleaning up their old stuff. They're focused on Right, creating new documents. The new, the new stuff is in. This, uh, this filing has to be made by the end of the day. Yada yada yada. Nobody ever has time to go back and clean up the old crap. So the old crap hangs around, hangs around, hangs around. Some of the things we want to never delete, but once a case is closed, maybe we only want to keep that around for seven years, right? And once the seven years is up, because that's when Manitoba Archives is going to delete the paper, right? Incinerating it or shredding it or whatever, right? At that point, we can make the electronic document go away. So again, those are those are things that, that we want to have happen automatically. When we have, I'll get to you in just a second, when we, when we get the close date for, for a file, well now maybe what we can do is within our document management system, say we've had the close date, the file is done, the evidence gets deleted you know, right away, the stuff, the court filing papers, the, the all of that sort of stuff, that's going to disappear seven years from now. So we want to tag that somehow and say, yeah, seven years from now, some cleanup routine is going to is going to find that and kick it in the head and get rid of it. Yes? I assume you've got some sort of checks in there also to make sure that someone doesn't accidentally close a case that 
wasn't meant to be closed and then everything disappears on them and yeah well and that's that's always a uh, that's always a, a, an issue that you're that you're dealing with all the time of course you can literally just have a lawyer accidentally right it's a our our application that we use to to manage our court cases are are you know it's a web application someone can always misclick and we often get the the frantic you know, oh my God! I just closed this case, and and uh, and uh, you know now we, I got to reopen it, and here's the case number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The third thing, of course, that we need, and this is mandated uh, to us by uh, it's not only just good common sense, but it's mandated by the provincial auditors, is of course we have to have an on-site mirror or off-site mirror. So <laughs> every night we're not only doing backups, right, but we're also mirroring everything off-site. Um, so we want that to to continue to to happen. Well, of course, with a database, especially we use Postgres. Postgres has the mirroring capability. So, from the point of view, if we actually stored all of our stuff in in the uh, uh, in Postgres and set up an offsite mirror, we have not only the dual advantage of having our offsite mirror happen automatically without any any input on our part. Right, the mirror is just going to you know run. But we also have the advantage that in the event that our main database goes down, we can just quickly point the document management system at the at the offsite mirror, and uh, away it goes. So, uh, one of the things that that I propose to uh, management, and uh, I've uh, sort of written up a bit of a white paper on it, and uh, how did it? Ooh, good shape. Uh, one of the things that I proposed to management was to give me a little bit of time to come up with a, a bit of a proof of concept for them um, and uh, show it off at a uh, meeting and I think we've got it, hopefully we've got it scheduled for, for next month sometime. Um, most document management systems of course start with the flashy web bit and I'm a systems guy. Hey, hey end user presentation stuff, right? <laughs> I want to do the I want to do the low level fun hacking underneath the, mm -hmm. the covers, all the all the uh, uh, all the good stuff. Uh, we've got uh, our our two uh, uh, very very talented uh, developers that we've got, uh, Greg Valport and uh, Wei Lu. Uh, they uh, they will be able uh, if we decide to go down this route, they would be able to, to come up with a with a nice. Uh, uh, front end for it and tie it into our existing system. Um, I'm interested in the file system part, and that since that's a key thing, right? That's going to be how we're going to get those multifunction machines banging in evidence, and that's how we're going to be able to basically present the document management system in a way, right? It's just going to be a shared drive for most people. They're going to save files in a directory hierarchy. By saving it in a directory hierarchy, we can apply tags to it, right? So, for instance, maybe we we uh, we mount or create a directory structure where we have you know share case number, right? File number, right? Well, if we do that, we can very deliberately with a uh, with a uh, uh, function within the database. If they create a, uh, a case number or a file number, we just tag that. And then when they're in the web interface and they search, they can search for either the case number or the file number and get all the listing of the documents. But from the uh, legal secretary's point of view, he or she just sits there and bangs out the documents and just drops them in a location and it's automatically getting tagged as part of the, as part of the thing. So that's sort of what we want. And that's the bit that a lot of the document management uh, solutions that we looked at didn't implement. So of course that's what I implemented first. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some um, rather odd uh, development ideas. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about them, then you can you can uh, goggle at my naivete. Uh, but. Um, I really, really like, uh, first of all, when I'm developing, I don't develop for, um, I don't develop for speed first, I develop for correctness first. I think, um, I can't remember who, who it was, I don't know if it was Dykstra or, or somebody else, but it, it, premature optimization 
is the is the bane of, of programming, right? We all too often begin to start thinking about, you know, how am I going to make this faster? How am I going to, oh, I gotta need a cache in here. Oh, I need this, I need that. Rather than the correctness of, of what it is that, that we're programming and make sure that that, that works. I, I think that's, I like that idea. So um, I tend, when I'm developing something new, to focus on getting it correct first, and then I'll add in exactly the amount of speed up that I need after the fact. Um, the other thing that, that I've had very, very good uh, success with in the past is the, the clear distinction between the business logic, the, the store, and the presentation layer. Um, we've had a... Um, we have an application that was written by an outside vendor, and uh, they made some some decisions that um, I think uh, sort of haunted us. Uh, there were some things that they were doing where they were sort of uh, bypassing the the strict database sort of uh, functionality. We're trying to do stuff up at a higher layer. Uh, an example of of what we uh, of one of the things that we had were. Um, Rather than using within the database, right? Databases have this absolutely fantastic thing called sequences, right? I mean, you 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 ask it for a number, and it gives you a monotonically increasing guarantee to be unique for that database number, right? It's very simple, it's very elegant, and most importantly, <coughs> right? You can use it as a method for ordering, right? Because obviously, one comes before two, comes before three. The only problem was that they saw when they were doing that was, well, that would require an extra call for us to the database. So what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of using sequences, we're going to use, uh, what do they call that? UUIDs. UUIDs. So they decided that they were going to, because they could generate their UUID up, up one layer higher, rather than letting the, the database manage things, they generate these UUIDs. Well, this makes it very, very hard to order some things, right, and get some data out of uh, the database. We had one particular meeting um, uh, where they were doing some time stuff, right? Lawyers have to enter an account for their time. And they had used, instead of using a, a time date field, they had simply used a date field, right? Mm -hmm. So what had happened was, is of course, a lawyer makes 50, 50 things in a day, and then, of course, what does a lawyer want to do? Oh, what did I do early on in the morning? Right? <laughs> you list your time. Well, if you had been using sequences, you could order them in sequence order. But of course, you don't have sequences, you have UUIDs. So what ends up happening is, is what you did five minutes ago ends up being first, and what you did at nine o'clock ends up being at the middle, and what you did at two o'clock ends up, you know, at the end, and it's all a big mishmash. And it necessitated them doing a, uh, a database change midway through development that they were just sort of counting on. So um, I think that you really, and especially when you're dealing with uh, with a really powerful database like Postgres, right, that has a, a, a rich uh, functional uh, programming ability uh, that has triggers and all of the good stuff that you'd expect in an asset compliant database. You want to do all that work down in the database. You want the database, mm -hmm. you want to write those functions and have all the management down there and then higher up, right, you're not doing any work, right, you're just calling functions in the database. All your business logic is in the database. Why? Because the database knows best how to manage the data, right, not right. you. So uh, that was uh, that was one of the things that I was looking at. We haven't got here yet, but um, um, we're uh, we're quite interested in using a, a, a well understood uh, web framework, maybe Rails, maybe Django, uh, something like that. And the Fuse file system part, uh, where uh, I started in Python, uh, it may migrate to C, but uh, we'll uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, Okay, now enough time uh, for me to talk, or, uh, out of out of talking and more of me pointing things out and how easy it is, how quickly this sort of came together. Back to my, uh, yeah. Okay, so we ran into uh, there were a couple of things that um, when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with. Um, uh, anything to do with file systems, 
two of your key things that you want to always deal with are your, your path names. How Fuse actually sends you file names is it gives you a path name relative to the mount point. Every time it sends you a path name, it sends you an absolute path name. So it's always got the full, full directory. So you always want to use the, the base name and dir name calls, right? Extract out the, the base name of the file, extract out the <coughs> dir, dir name of, of what it's doing. Well, I could write that in string functions within Postgres, but I sort of felt it probably made a, a, a little bit more sense. So just as a, just as a background here. Um, how many people have ever written C language uh, plugins for Postgres before? How many people have done a lot of Postgres programming? I don't. I'm not a. I'm not an expert by any sense. Jim could probably run rings around me any day of the week and twice on Sunday, uh, but uh, I've I've done a little bit. Uh, one of the really brilliant things about Postgres is the plugin architecture that basically allows you if there's a function or, or something like that that isn't inherent in the language you just go ahead and write it in C and, and plug it in. Well of course C, uh, for any of you uh, familiar with the standard library, you know the, the base name and dir name calls are, are quite well known. Uh, so I figured well why not just use those rather than re-implementing them in, uh, in uh, Postgres. This is 76 lines worth of code to basically provide PG dir name and basically I'm just pulling off, um, I'll just give you a, a quick one down here. Uh, so I just check to see if we've got null arts and then we basically just have to allocate a little bit of space. Uh, you might notice the P out uh, if you're within Postgres, uh, you use Postgres, uh, you don't use malloc because basically Postgres wants to be in control of all of its memory. So if you need more memory, you're inside of Postgres, you want to you wanna grab some more memory, you want to use PALloc, and that lets uh, Postgres know. One of the, I've seen plugins for Postgres that use malloc, and sometimes you get crashing with those because now you've got Postgres and, uh, and, uh, and the standard malloc sort of arguing over where the, the end of memory is. So always use PL, and then essentially I just call the call the dir name uh, function and return the results. And I do dir name, and I also do uh, base name. Exactly the same thing. That's basically it to add. Oh yes, and I also do a um, uh, one of the other things that you quite often deal with. Postgres, of course, deals with time the way you want databases to deal with time. Right? Databases, you want minutes and seconds and you want to parse stuff out and that's all very good. But of course if you're doing a file system, for anybody who's ever done anything, you know, uh, looked at the, uh, the get attribute call, right? How does Unix do time? Unix does time by number of seconds since, you know, January 1st, midnight January 1st, 1970. Um, so again, I could have probably come up with a purely uh, Postgres function to do that. but what the heck, it's like six or seven lines to just call time, and then I've got it. Uh, so I just uh, wrote, a, wrote a quick little plug-in for that. So from there, so you basically extended Postgres. I've extended Postgres. I've yeah, added some, some new functions, built -in functions. Right, yeah. specifically to dealing with file systems. Mm -hmm. uh, just for just for laughs, I'll just show you the sequel here. This is where the bulk of the uh, of the uh, work is done. Um, I've started off with this. Of course, it's going to be much greater as time goes along. But uh, I've essentially, at this point, got three tables. I've got tree, uh, the inode table. So the tree implements the the structure as uh, the directory tree is a structure. The inode table is going to store all of the standard things that you have in a, uh, uh, in a Unix file system. So uh, the inode, uh, the inode is there, the mode, those would be your permissions, 
marking whether or not something's a directory or, uh, or a, a socket or whatever would be in there. The number of links, right? So if you've got a directory, you need to link in all the subdirectories, etc. UID, GID, the size of the file, uh, the A time, the M time, the C time. And finally, the file object ID. And I've got a third table, uh, which right at the moment, uh, the main thing is the object, which is the, the byte A. That's going to be our actual file. I've got a few other things in there. I've started off with looking at version priority. One of the things, uh, Jim came and, and visited me in the summer, and uh, we did a little bit of hacking. One of the things that I want out of this file system is when people delete things, and I don't want it to actually delete. What I want it to do is get marked as deleted, and then it will disappear from the file system, but at some point I'll be able to, you know, just by basically making a, uh, a change in the database, bring it back. The second thing that I wanted, um, I deal with this all the time. Uh, we keep only three to four weeks worth of archive. Uh, as you can imagine, we, it ends up taking a, a fair amount of space up. Um, and what ends up happening is you get this call, yeah, but five months ago, uh, this document, you know, had some stuff, and then I'm going to change in it, and yeah, it's been a couple of months now, and ah, I really want to go back to that previous version of the document. Does the backups go back that far? No, sorry, they don't. Well, what I'd like to do uh, as part of this is uh, essentially keep at least, depending upon the, the space, a certain number of previous revisions. So when you overwrite the file, again, it's not going to uh, overwrite the file. It'll create a previous revision and then come up with a new revision. When you look at the file, you'll always get the previous, but then when you tell me five months ago I had this in the file and I want to go back to that, all I need to do is just back down the revision number by one and away we go. So I've sort of started some of that. But as you can see, it's it's quite, uh, at this point, it's quite simple. My goal was to prove that we could get the, the database working as a file system. The big bit is, of course, the, uh, the fuse functions. Now, um, I'll show you the, uh, the Python in a bit. The one thing that I am somewhat annoyed about, and I won't just send an angry letter to the Python people, or sort of the Postgres people, because they've done such a marvelous job everywhere else. But of course, one of the things that I wish that uh, Postgres did was have global constants, so I could just define some global mm -hmm. constants. Right? When you, one of the things that I will have to do as part of uh, handling file system uh, semantics is I'm going to have to provide or return proper uh, errors, right, to the file system. So things like, uh, you know, EIO, uh, e-access, right, you know, when you, get a, when you get a failure for something, if it's going to work down on the file system level, it's got to get the proper, you know, Unix uh, error no uh, uh, return to it. So what I really wish that you could do is that in somewhere you could define a, um, uh, a set of constants. I know, I know, I should probably stick this in a table somewhere. Uh, and I may end up finally doing that, but uh, it would be nice if it was just a constant. Can you have more than one error at the same time? Um, well, in, in, in the Unix uh, standard library, no. Typically, the uh, you, you only get one error out of a function. <coughs> For instance, if you've got malloc, right, I mean, the, the most obvious one that's going to return is I don't have enough free free memory to return it, but there's a bunch of things that malloc can return. But you're pretty much only ever going to get one error back. Right? Typically, I mean, in Unix, in the in the C Unix library, right, the first thing that fails is what you return. You just die at that point and say, oh, I can't carry on anymore. So there's also some... Uh, the other thing that uh, Postgres doesn't uh, have is the ability to uh, bit fields, so I can't do 0x400, <laughs> so I have to very, very laboriously go and <laughs> convert all of those into decimal. Uh, I'll figure out something better for that. But at any rate, um, essentially all we need to do, I've got a couple of functions here for, uh, uh, for creating a, a stat buffer, so that when I return a, uh, uh, when I return out of 
a function. I'm going to return a, a pseudo row. So uh, that's for get end. So that's how I'm going to return that. And we need a little function that's going to uh, allow me to find an inode, right? So when I'm looking for when I'm looking for a file name, it's going to turn it back into an inode number that then I can select on. Uh, and you can see, uh, like I say, my uh, my uh, SQL foo is not uh, fantastic. I'm sure Mikul is looking at it and grimacing, but it works. This I'll, talk, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> this looks like code, not SQL. It's it's. It's the it's the yeah it's the, procedural language. it's the Postgres procedural PAPGS language. Right? Well. This is the part where I said that when I'm dealing with with Postgres, I want to let Postgres handle all the data, right? I could very easily write all of this probably a lot more simply up in or definitely a lot more simply up in Python, right? And then just make database calls, but I don't want to do that, right? What I want is I want because as time goes along, what's going to end up happening is when I'm opening a file. Right? Or when I'm opening a file for writing, I'm going to want callouts in the database. Now I'm going to be able to to provide maybe a uh, application specific, and I'll get to that as sort of my future plans for Eludra. Um, I want to have my my uh, a callout that somebody can provide, and when I open a file for writing. I am going to then pick out part of that path and provide tags, right? That you're then going to pick up on the on the website, right? So that when you're looking at the at the file system, you don't have any of that on on a file system, right? On the file system side, you're just basically dealing with directories and modes. You could do, I suppose, uh, set some extended attributes or something like that and do some stuff that way, uh, but that support isn't very. You know, if you're in uh, I don't even think uh, Nautilus uh, with a gnome, I don't even think they have any interface in there to do any of the set X out or stuff. Uh, so essentially, we just do this. Let's go down. And then we get into the, the bulk of the, um, uh, the, the fuse stuff. So essentially, all I do is I, I just find my I node uh, from my absolute path. And then I just return a row. So select mm -hmm. the result. Boom, 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 and return that to the to the function. Reader. Okay. I'm going to basically do a select uh, from the uh, from the tree, right? Everything that find the parent of that node, return all of the nodes that are uh, have that parent. I just want to sh somewhere in here. Let me just see. Yeah, there we go. Um, remember when I talked about base name, right? Those two C functions. Well, if since I've got those in there, I just get to call that as a first-rate function. Right? It just appears as something within within Postgres. It's oh, just right. a function that's that's in there. Right. So, you know, base name doesn't exist normally within the P PL PG SQL, uh, but it's there because I've added it, and uh, that just allows me to. Uh, uh, to do, I think I've got, I think I was about now in there. Yeah, so remember when I also said the, the time, right, getting that Unix epoch, I call the function now. So now what I want to get for when I'm looking into uh, inserting some of that stuff, it's it's now. Or is it now, now is already there. Now, now is already there. Now is already time. Into All right, yeah, PG yeah time. Unix time. Sorry, that was oh, okay. it. So I just call Unix time, yeah. right? Because when you're dealing with, um, hmm. uh, I don't know how many people know this, but when you're dealing with uh, with a file system, right? Unix keeps three separate times associated with every file. Right? There's the creation time, C time. There's the uh, modification time, M time, and then there's A time, which is uh, when you have last access the file. I even keep track. I've been up, you know, I update A time. So it'll do full file system semantics when it's uh, uh, when it's done. So that's all of the stuff that I'm doing, right? I'm implementing that, that get adder, the open, the read, the write. Oh, I mentioned this in, in uh, one of the problems, and this is the, the first thing, and it's probably the biggest hurdle if you actually get into doing anything with Fuse. It's the thing that's going to probably screw you up right at the beginning. Where's the close, right? There's an open, but there's no close. There's a, there's a uh, flush and a finish, I believe it's called. Um, 
The reason why is because of the fact that you don't have a close is because it's kind of hard in the Unix world to tell when a file is actually closed. Close isn't what you think it is, right? Because a file can be opened multiple times. Right? More than one person, you, know, you can have somebody reading and writing it, and you can have another person reading it. Think of when you're doing a, uh, uh, a tail minus f on a log file. Right? The system, syslog has got the file open and is actually writing to the file. You're periodically opening the file from reading and pulling the, the, the diff out of it. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, flush is what you want. Right? Flush becomes your close. So that is the call that the file so that the kernel will make when everybody is done reading and writing that that file. So flush is usually what you implement. So this is all the the uh, Postgres uh, SQL PL uh, PG SQL uh, language. What happens is because I've implemented all of this uh, as stored procedures, the uh, fuse part of it, which is done in Python right at the moment. Uh, right now, the, the, the file system is only 209 lines long. The reason why is so again, I do a little bit. The, the biggest pain in the butt that you always have to deal with is the, uh, is the stat stuff. Because you've got a lot of little names that you've got to fiddle around with. But essentially, when I init, uh, I'm Probably a fair number of you have seen the, the Python bindings for Postgres. Yes? Uh, basically, I connected the database, uh, I get myself set up, and then essentially I call a procedure. Right? I open up a cursor, call fuse, get adder, deal with the results. Read dirt, same thing. Call the procedure, deal with the results. Change mod, same thing. Call procedure, deal with, you know, return the result, etc. I'm not actually doing any work, right, in in the Python file system because of the fact that all the work has been done down in the database, right? All of the maintaining of the tables and and uh, maintaining the links and all of that, I'm handling down in the database where it makes the most sense, right? If I were to do that up in the up in the database portion, right? I'd be running selects to find the parent and all of that up in the up in the uh, up in the Python section. Here, I just basically call the procedure, call the procedure, call mm -hmm. the procedure. I'm thinking at this point, I'm probably going to end up leaving it, with the exception of implementing an attribute cache. The only thing, and I'll show you, it's a little bit slow right at the moment. The reason why is because of, uh, and I'll actually turn on debugging in. in Fuse and, and show you what that looks like. Fuse is constantly calling get attribute. Right? If you do a dir every single solitary file in the directory, it calls get attribute on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's constantly hammering that attribute cache or the the, uh, the attributes. Well, right now I haven't implemented an attribute cache, so of course every time that's going to be a sort procedure and it's going to be a query. Um, I haven't even put any indexes on the tables yet, right? I'm sort of in the early pages. But I can see that where things are going to have to go, I'm going to need an attribute cache. Most Fuse file systems typically implement at least an attribute cache, right? Where once you touch an attribute, once you've looked up the attribute of a file, you cache that locally, right? At this level, you know if you're ever going to invalidate that cache, right, because if I ever run a chown on a file, right, then I know that I can sort of invalidate that, that cache entry because I've had to touch it. Okay? So implementing an attribute cache isn't, uh, isn't very difficult uh, with a few file system. In fact, that was one of the earliest optimizations that they made to, to NFS. Those of you who've used NFS, you know, one of the biggest things that you can do is the mm. tweaking of the attribute cache within NFS. Same thing, right? Getting all those at get attribute calls is a very, very expensive operation, and that's the, the one thing. Sorry, did you have a, a question? No. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I was just waving my hand around. <laughs> <laughs> so just to show you what this uh, what this looks like. 
Um, it doesn't look like much, but it's still pretty exciting for something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically all we're going to do is we're just going to do Luger FS and uh, let's do... So here's some uh, here's some some stuff that I that I put in there. I've actually I, I copied in one of the first things that I did was I copied in the uh, the uh, the LS program, and of course I can actually run it right from the uh, uh, right from the uh, the file do system. A, do a LS minus L so we can see yep. the other attributes. Because you're maintaining permissions and ownership and timestamps yep. and everything. Oh, wow. So it's doing the full. Uh, it's doing all the uh, all the stuff. So, for instance, in the in the foop directory, right? You can see uh, my link count currently is is two. Your link count is always two by default, right? So if I see out of the directory, if I mkdir verbal. Right now, my foop is bumped yeah. up to a link count of three. Yeah. Right. So I'm doing all of that. That's all database stuff that's happening happening underneath the uh, the covers. Now, just to show you that this, like I say, we'll um, mm -hmm. just do a remove minus xrf sys. And so you know we can already do removes and, and, and deletes and all of that kind of stuff. And the interesting thing, of course, is going under <coughs> covers. PSQL file system. Let's do a tree. So there's currently the the, the status Ooh. of the tree, right? The the inodes and the parents. Uh, I store the individual name and then the full path as well. Uh, that's for speed and some uh, and some selecting. Again, if we take a look, uh, let's uh, select star from inode where st inode equals, oh, I don't know, 2513. Okay, so there's all my light bulb, my I mode, my SD mode, number of links, UAD, GID, the size is 114,000. And if I actually go, I won't do this for, <coughs> for LS since that's a fairly large file, but if we go to select So you can see the actual data, the file has, this is a test, and of course it even puts in the, you can see that the, the new line is in there, right? Just slash x before you do that. Okay. EQ. Sorry, slash x here? Slash x, yeah. Uh, the other x slash. Oh, okay. Backslash x. You know, you know more than I do. Yeah, and then rerun that select. Right there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. look at you. So, and if I go in here, so let me just go over here, and let's just for polarity's sake. Did you have to implement them like the remove command, the 
Yeah, it, it, and, it, and, it, and basically all you're doing is you're dropping, right at the moment I haven't got, the, the remove is actually deleting the, the, the thing, but I mean eventually I'm going to add in the bit where it's just going to bump back a version number or mark it as deleted and that sort of stuff, but right at the moment I was implementing getting the, you know, getting the, uh, the file system semantics going. But it's actually, as you can see, I mean, we're restoring the object in the database and all of that, so, yes? Uh, you made mention of uh, certain calls you would want to implement. What happens if it just doesn't make sense for the data you're trying to model? What it, then you just don't implement that 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 uh, call. You basically just return, like for instance, let's say that you had, well, I'll give you a perfect example. In my, uh, in, remember I talked about that file system for that little uh, logic board, right? You're never going to remove any of the files, right? I mean, they they represent pins, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense to, I just don't implement remove. I just returned success. So right? you didn't have to implement the unlink call, but yeah. you just said return success. Yeah, I just basically, it's like one line. So you implement unlink and you just say return success. And I could say remove this file. And of course, Unix following the the least amount of noise is, is, is preferable, uh, you know, idea. It just very quietly says, all right, yeah, it was a success. And of course, when you do an LS, the file is still there. So you should stub out at least every one. Yeah, I, I think by default, I, I think most of the, of the, um, um, I think, I think the defaults, if you don't stub it out, um, you know, uh, it will just return uh, so if you don't actually do it, it's the same thing. I've just gotten into the habit of, you know, I've got sort of like I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, template for, for C file systems, and it's all implemented. It's just a reminder to me of the, what I have to uh, implement. Yes? How do you handle stuff like C calls? Which calls? C. Which, which calls? C. Like, uh, like oh, C, uh, essentially what, we're, what I'm doing right at the moment is when you open up the file, it's going to copy down to the local uh, I cr uh, the local file system. I create a temporary file. I do all of the reading and writing and seeking and munging on that, right? And then when I actually flush the call, right? When I, when flush gets called, in other words, this file is finished. Okay. Then at that point, I upload it to the to the database. Yeah, because otherwise, um, you'd end up with making a huge amount of. Of, of database calls, you probably don't want that, right? Yeah. But that means that basically the only thing that's going to be on the local file system at any particular given time is whatever's being actively read or written to, and it also helps to maintain sort of uh, atomicity within the, you know, you're only ever going to be uploading a completed file, right? So. Back, back in the days of LTSPFS when we used views, uh, one of our biggest hurdles we ran into was was the free space call, I forget what, DF3 yeah. or D3 or whatever. Can you do it here? How, how would you, I have how would no you tell the free space on the database? I, I have no free clue. That one would probably be, I, I would more than likely handle that myself personally. I've, you've asked this this question of me, and I, I kind of figured you were going to ask me to put me on the spot here. But uh, how I will probably deal with that is I will more than likely have something that will take a look on the database server itself and uh, as, a, as a rough, you know, if my, where my database is sitting is, you know, a terabyte big and it's currently uh, so much used up, then I'll probably use that. Um, worst case scenario, I'll just return a completely fake number. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. That's an implementation enough. Yeah, yeah. detail. Just, just return enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't. It's it's, yeah. Enough. The only thing that you want to you want to return is I think no Unix call right ever looks at the free space ahead of time right because what it's going to do is it will it, like for instance if you're if you're using VI right VI doesn't check to see how much space is on the file system it tries to open it for 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 writing. Uh, when you when you go to save, it will come back and say, right, no no space left on device, right? But something like Nautilus, right, or 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 something lots like that. Lots of Windows programs via Samba. Well, yeah, lots of Windows programs via Samba are going to check how much space is on the device. Well, I mean, it, it, worst case scenario, you just say, yeah, you got a terabyte, you know, just. You're, you're good. Yeah, because even an open office might check for the free yeah, space exactly. before yeah. write the file. That's kind of, I mean, yeah. I suppose what I could do, uh, there's a whole bunch of 
inelegant things that yeah. I can do. Yeah. It's hard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's part of the problem with being Especially in a multi-user server environment. Yeah, exactly. It's it may be available right has now. yet to be determined. <laughs> I think you were first, and then I'll get to you. Sorry. But right now, historians, researchers, people can go back and look at documents, court documents from the 1200s or 1700s or something like that. What are they going to do with this? Is anybody going to ever be able to see into this and, uh, and determine what was going on? This is, this is a real, uh, th this is of particular interest to me. And I wrote a, um, um, I wrote a uh, white paper years ago um, that kind of got circulated around a little bit within the Manitoba legal community. Uh, it's one of the things that I'm uh, acutely aware of. Um, not only there's the actual storage problems, right? There's you know uh, what are we going to put this stuff on? Right? You know, there's 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 the uh, uh, there's the whole you know a, D, a DVD is going to you know a, a DVDR is going to last you know ten years before the data on it is no good, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's those physical storage problems, right? How are we going to make this stuff hang around? Um, then there's also the problem of what format are you going to store this stuff in that 10 years from now you're going to be able to read that, right? Um, I started off my, uh, my computing career with uh, the, the Commodore world many, many years ago, Commies, Commie 64s. And I can't even remember the name of the word processor, but there was a word processor that I you know, bought at great expense to my 13-year-old budget. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was on a floppy disk, and I had a whole bunch of schoolwork, you know, and I, I'd love to be able to go back and look at that now. Guess what? The Commodore doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The floppy disks have all, you know, <laughs> crumbled to dust, and even if the Commodore worked, and even if I could still, you know, read those, you know, read those diskettes on, on, on a different machine, that program, I mean, they guy, they went out of business a long, long time ago. I, who knows what that stuff was stored in? So I know somebody who, do, who knows that. Yeah. So yeah. who's always got a, a working system? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, but it, but the problem is, is that we've only been 50, 60 years into this whole uh, into this whole um, issue of archiving stuff, and I, and I, you know, right now they're they're providing court documents in, in this program, in this proprietary program called For the Record. And the problem with it is, is, is for the record going to be around 60 years from now? Right? There's no statute of limitations on a murder. Right? They routinely investigate 50, 60 year old murders. Right? It happens. Right? And you want to be able to look at that evidence. If you've gone and stored your, your autopsy photographs in you know a proprietary format. I mean, God only knows whether or not GIF. You'd still be able to find something that will read GIF, but GIF is at least a published standard. Worst case scenario, some future hacker, you know, with the you know spike in the back of his head, could you know <laughs> the, the Matrix thing could you know dream up a, a GIF reader and at least look at all of that. But I mean, if it's in a proprietary format, I'm afraid of luck, right? It's it's a real problem. It's a real problem. Um, we we hit the ball out of the park with paper, right? Acid-free paper is still really one of the best archival uh, well, uh, I think mediums. Well, caveman that you did pretty good too. Yeah, well, there, yeah, rock is pretty good. Hold on, there was one here, and then I'll get to you. Sorry to mention on that question because uh, you've picked open office and you have a standard format. Sounds like you could probably mine uh, tags, keywords, indexes out of the document and part of this file system. Precisely. You could actually that would index be all that stuff. my plan. The plan for Eludra, and, and, and one of the things that I want to state, I've already uh, the little that has been done at this point um, <coughs> is is already up on GitHub. I'll show you guys the the address later. Um, if this continues on, and, and and I may continue on with it myself, even if Legal Aid doesn't uh, end up wanting to go. Uh, this route, but one of the things that I would want would be plugins, right? So that when you're dealing either via the web interface or via the, the, the file system interface, as you save documents of a specific type, right, 
we've got that beautiful within the we've got the magic uh, cookie file within within Unix. You can read, so you can very easily and MIME types and all that all very well understood. As those documents are coming in, either by the fuse interface or by the web interface, right, you're going to scan stuff, you're going to pull out stuff, you're going to automatically tag. Right? If everybody sets their, if everybody sets their uh, uh, within Open Office, right? Everybody skips by this screen, but the screen at the beginning that says who, who you know your 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 author is, right? Well, if everybody fills that in, and I pull that out as you're saving documents in, you would be able to right away say, what are all the documents that have ever been authored by this person, even if this person isn't a current user with oh, sorry, the blue screen of death. Um, uh, even if this uh, person, you know, you've deleted this user ID and, you know, the, this person isn't here anymore, it's still a tag within the database. You can pull that up. So, yeah, very definitely. That's what I want as a plug-in. Because the bottom line is, if I'm going to write a document management system, there's no use case that I'm ever going to be able to come up with. Right, that's going to satisfy everybody. So what you want is a document management system that maybe implements sort of the bare minimum of what you would expect out of a document management system, and then allow a rich plug-in system, right, that a local, uh, that somebody who would be implementing that within their environment can write all of the specific business logic, right? If you're, uh, if you're Boeing, right, you're gonna want something that's going to tag it for what plane this this schematic is for, right? If you're in the legal world, you're going to want to tag it with who the respondent is. Those things are going to be different, and I want to basically provide a, a framework that people are going to be able to plug into and, and deal with. Yes, uh, you had a question back uh, there. Yeah, well, it wasn't really a question. I was just adding a comment. I used to work in the mainframe business, and it used to be... 80 column Hollywood cards, and then it was 7 track tape, and then it was uh, 9 track tape, and then it was faster 9 track tape, and, and higher data rates uh, 9 track tapes, and, and all this stuff. And so it's, uh, it's easy to have, even if the format, even if the data lasts forever, do you still even have a reader that can read the things? Yeah, well, I, I think for the mainframe world, for those old 9 track tapes, there's some company that basically, that's out there on the internet. And what they do is they just basically keep a couple of old nine track tape readers going and they charge you top dollar, you know, you've got, oh yeah, we've got that on some old nine track tape, we need to get it off now, right? And you ship it down to these now guys they, and they read it off and give it back to you and okay. it's um, a text file, yeah. Now they don't use the big wheels, they use, they use cartridges. Yeah. Of course that, I'm talking back in 2002, who knows what it is now. Yeah. But, yeah. but even there, if you've got the data back, I mean, you wouldn't get back the application that read exactly. it. Exactly. So you know, now you know how to precise do with that data and once it. Uh, and that was that was the reason why I was very specifically, and I, and I put this proposal through to. Uh, we've got the in Canada. We have the RCMP. Uh, we have the local uh, police forces. We've got the crowns. I'm saying, look, 50 years from now, for the record, isn't going to exist. But you've probably got a lot better chance that a PDF reader is still going to exist, or you know, uh, an image viewing program that's going to understand JPEGs is going to exist. When you guys are dealing with data, don't go out and buy a proprietary solution that's going to, you know, lock you into a proprietary format. If it's going to be a picture, store it as a JPEG. If it's going to be a movie, store it as a, you know, a, a, an MPG file. If it's going to be a document, convert it into a PDF and, and have it as a PDF. That, it's not going to completely future-proof you, but you're going to have a darn sight better hope of that than, than anything else. Are and that's, that's an issue. Are you getting any buy-in? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, you know, no, I, I see a whole lot of, of that going on, and I mean, I, I, I'm amazed that you've got your whole group there to, to agree to open Office. Yeah, I, I, mean, I haven't seen Office Space that does that. Yeah. Everybody wants Microsoft. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we had the advantage that in the legal world we came from uh, Word Perfect, and when Word Perfect yeah. finally went the way of uh, went the way of the pterodactyl, uh, has it done? Uh, is it the, is it well, I, I don't know. Is Corel, I think, still has it. Yeah, there's it's still a ghost of their former selves. It, um, you could probably get a program, Yeah. but you'd be the only one that had it. Mm -hmm. so you could create files that nobody else could read. And, and in the legal profession, WordPerfect used to be king. Oh, yeah. They yeah, were they were it, 
Right? Well, wow, that was king every profession yeah, for well, a while. It was definitely, it was really king in the legal profession because they specifically had some bits in there that were sort of geared towards, you know, doing factums and, and, and stuff like oh, that. Okay. There were some specific formatting, you know, oh, embellishments. You cross through too, where you yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's document huge. formats and stuff like that. The, the whole I think you'd be, I, as a matter of fact, um, uh, not meaning to to blow Legal Aid's horn too terribly much here, but Legal Aid actually, uh, we were the people who um, um, paid for the, the word perfect filters for open office were in a pretty sorry state. And when we were in the, the situation of converting from word perfect to open office, uh, we uh, contacted a, a, a couple of guys out on the internet and paid them, I think it was 2,500 bucks, we came up with about eight or ten features that we absolutely, positively have to have in order to be able to have a hope of opening up our, our legacy documents and dealing with them in a not too, you know, not have too much formatting, right? Uh, that we need to do. Uh, we we paid for those uh, functions to be implemented, and we also pushed for getting the WordPerfect filters included in Base Open Office. And uh, so if you ever are in open office and you open a WordPerfect document and it opens, you can thank Legal Aid Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, okay. that was, that was a, a you're uh, you're well, like Actually, you can thank primarily the <laughs> hackers that did it. Uh, but uh, we, we had a, a, a bit of uh, hand in it. Uh, I, I can see that I've probably gone over my time. Well, you lost your internet connection for a second. Oh, uh, did I? Up in a minute. Yeah, I shut oh, well. down. Well, well, no, you were connected through. I'll wrap it up. I'm sure everybody wants to go home. So, um, we've sort of been dealing with the, the, the questions. Uh, if anybody's uh, got uh, comments or, or rotten... Oh, go away. <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to sort of follow this along, uh, I've got some... Uh, I, I might not make too much press on it in the next...